Hello everyone, good morning. I'm Manami Sasaki I'm from the uh, Sternwart, the, the observatory in Bamberg, which is part of the Erlang Center for Astroparticle Physics of the University of Erlang Nuremberg. And I have the pleasure today to speak to you about our newest mission, the X-ray telescope, Erosita. And yeah, this is uh, where you see a sketch here already uh, provided by the DLR. So um, let, let me start by showing you this. Uh, Rosat was already mentioned by Professor Hoffman. Um, this is the X-ray sky as we have known it for quite a long time, since about the 1990s. Um, you see the entire sky here in this map. You have the galactic uh, plane in the center, in the horizontal. Um, yeah, in the horizontal. And then in the center, you have the galactic center region and you see the emission that we see we saw with the rosa telescope which you see here um, in the very soft x-ray range below 2.4 kv and what is uh, and, and this image is in three color presentation so what you see is the very soft the softest x-rays um, in red, uh, then you have in, in green, the medium band around one kV and up to 2.4 kV. Then you see the harder sources in blue. And you realize a lot of uh, emission is uh, absorbed along the galactic plane because X-rays are very uh, sensitive to uh, interstellar absorption. But then you see a lot of hard sources along the galactic plane. Those are neutron stars, black holes and um, bright sources like supernova remnants. And then you see a lot of emission also above and below the galactic plane in particular, which are very soft in red. And um, I would like to quickly go through the sources that cause these emission, especially in the galaxy, because this is what I would like to focus on X-ray sources in our Milky Way and in the nearby galaxies. So uh, as you know, galaxies are, are made of stars and uh, many of those are very massive stars and very massive stars have strong UV photons. So they're hot, you have strong UV photons and strong stellar winds. So each of such a massive star during its lifetime will create a, a bubble around it uh, because of the strong winds. And uh, this is typical, uh, one example, the, the nice bubble nebula seen in, in the optical, that's a stellar bubble. And in the diagram on the right-hand side, you see a standard model tick for explaining such a bubble. You see that the interior is very hot and is thin with low density is, and is filled with thermal hot plasma. And this is the, the source of bright X-rays while the swept up material around it, um, here you see, an H2 region with a shell that emits in the optical. Then if you have many of those stars, like in a stellar cluster, which, where you typically find stars, then this, uh, the combination of these stellar winds and also the supernova explosion in the end, we create larger structures that we call super bubbles. And we are actually located in such a larger bubble, the local bubble inside, Therefore, that's, that's the reason why we see this reddish emission around, around us below the plane, above the plane, below the plane, everywhere, because this is the hot gas that surrounds us. And um, if a galaxy evolves, of course, these, uh, these things can happen many times due to the many generations of stars that you have in a galaxy. So in, in uh, in principle, you will also get larger structures, which we call supergiant shells. So you have a combination of many H2 regions and super bubbles. And here again, you see in blue the optical emission and the H alpha emission and the X ray emission that fills the interior of a, such a super bubble. Uh, these two images are taken from the Large Magellanic Cloud. So this is the, near, the largest nearby galaxy, our satellite galaxy, and it's uh, one of the in principle, the best place to study emission coming from interstellar structures like this. Then if you have these stars, they will die in a supernova, as I mentioned before, and then uh, the, they will create um, also in interesting interstellar structures, which we call the supernova remnant. Here you see uh, examples of uh, this uh, remnants of the supernova that 
have been detected by uh, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, and another one in the same region in the sky, the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant, which are yeah, only a few hundred years old, and you, you see they are very bright X-ray sources. And this is because the ex supernova explosion produces a strong shock, and uh, this will ionize and, and heat the environment. Then also the ejecta that is thrown out of the stars, and in these strong shock waves, also particles accelerated. That's why they are also very interesting high energy sources. Then here I wanted to show you another example of, uh, of these combinations, of what we actually do if we observe something like this. So there's another super bubble in a large Magellanic cloud where you see nicely see the combination of everything. So this is um, an optical image. So in the narrow bands of H alpha, but also the forbidden lines of sulfur two and oxygen three combined in three colors. And as you see, it's a large structure filled with stellar clusters and associations marked here in, in white. And these are the stars that are powering these structures and heating and creating this in, uh, emission nebula. And as you see, you already see a difference in color here and in this main structure. And this one looks different and that's because it is a supernova remnant. And one of the stars that belong to these associations must have already exploded. And you see it also nicely as a very bright object in X-rays. So on the right-hand side, you see an X-ray image taken with XMM Newton, which is a, a yeah, currently working very good X-ray telescope. But on the other hand, you, will, uh, you also see that there is interior emission. And this is this hot gas that I was talking about created by the stellar winds of the stars that are inside the super bubble. So if you take again like a three color um, image in X-rays, you see it's very soft emission that you see in the interior and uh, a little harder emission coming from this supernova remnant. And you also see that this outer part where you see this bright emission in optical H2 region also seems to absorb some of the X-rays because you don't see emission around here. And then there is another interesting structure that you see here. Here it's more obvious than there. There's some additional significant emission towards the north. And that's actually coinciding, coinciding with the part of the H2 region where it seems to be broken. So it's not a nice circular shell. And then if you compare it with the density distribution in this region by looking at the distribution of atomic hydrogen, in the in radio, you see there is a strong density gradient. And the position where you see this emission, this the faint emission in X-ray coincide with, a, uh, with an area in the H1 distribution where there is still, there is a hole. So in this image, white means a lot of emission, so a lot of atomic hydrogen, and black means less atomic hydrogen. So these stars have carved a region here in, in, in the distribution of gas because of their stellar winds and also supernova explosion. But since there is a density gradient, there was also some outflow in this direction, which we can see in X-rays. And this is, these things um, happen a lot in the interstellar medium. And since uh, we are sitting inside, it is difficult to observe such a thing inside our Milky Way. We, as, as you saw, the emission coming from the bubble around us, we only see as very diffuse emission everywhere in the sky. And in the LMC, you can study those in detail because you can look at the galactic disk. Another um, galaxy, which is also very um, ideal for to studying the interstellar medium is the next spiral galaxy, the closest spiral galaxy to us, the Andromeda galaxy M31. And here you see it on the right-hand side, in the optical, so you see the distribution of the star. And on the left-hand side, you see the emission only showing the extended emission in X-rays, also taking with XMM Newton, we have performed a survey over the entire M31. And you see that, especially in this part where we have a um, pronounced ring in the uh, Andromeda Nebula, we also have um, enhanced X-ray emission, but there's also emission filling the parts inside it, especially again bright where you have these dust rings and a lot of 
um, emission in, in the central region. So by looking at those emission in also nearby, other nearby galaxy, we can uh, study the structure of the interstellar medium very well. So in, in the, um, especially the hot phase of the interstellar medium, but comparing it with other observations, like I showed you before, you will learn a lot about the uh, structure of the interstellar medium. Now, um, here I wanted to show you another example, maybe most um, many of you are familiar with. Um, so this is again another region in the Large Magellanic Cloud, the Tarantula Nebula, we also call it the Sertidoridus region, which is a supergiant H2 region. Um, we don't have such a large uh, region in, in our Milky Way. The next one would be in another nearby galaxy, M33. So this is uh, um, is an H2 region that uh, hosts uh, a lot of uh, very, very massive stars, wolf stars, or stars, and they, the winds, the combination of those winds of those stars, they create this very large structure. And if you look at this region in your X-rays, you realize, yes, you see this, so the Tarantula Nebula would be here. You see the brightest stars and st um, uh, stellar associations, stellar clusters inside here, and also emitting X-rays and in the thermal emission here. But then you also see this interesting region here on the right, which is a hard, so non-thermal X-ray source in a, with a ring-like structure. That's a region which we call 30 Doradus C. You see it here. And we, by now we know that it's a super, uh, super bubble as well, but it behaves a little different than the older super bubbles uh, we know. Or the other, uh, the other ones, as you saw, more, most of it uh, show pronounced X-ray emission that uh, comes from thermal plasma. And here again, um, you see the X-ray emission in, in three color presentations. So everything that is blue is very hard. It's above two kilo electron volt. And below that, you see a lot of thermal emission. On the right-hand side, again, a three-color um, presentation of the optical image and in contrast, the X-ray emission. And if you now take the, um, uh, the spectra in X-rays, what you see is that in all these parts of this uh, 30 Dorado C, you see very dominant non-thermal emission. And how can you see that for those that are, don't work, uh, are not familiar with X-ray um, spectra? In this interior region where you have a lot of thermal emission, you see these, um, these yeah, like um, bumps here in the spectra um, up to about two kilo electron volt. These are non, so uh, the CCD, resolution and energy resolution is not as good as, for example, in the optical. So you see them as like um, the emission lines of the ionized part, um, species. So highly ionized um, ion, like uh, oxygen, neon, magnesium, the elements that you encounter in interstellar space, you see as those bumps. So these are emission line features. And this is what you typically expect if you have thermal plasma at a high temperature. And, but you have also additional emission going up to higher energies. And this, uh, emi this emission is non-thermal emission, um, yeah, and, uh, which is shown, seen as a power law. And that's what is dominating here. So you see hardly emission line features here, but you have these big bumps here that goes up to high energies. And this is, this is because the, um, non-thermal emission is dominating. And see, here you see some signs of thermal emission, but that's not uh, what is very bright in, the, in this, especially in these outer regions. So this super, no, uh, sorry, the super bubble is known to be a very uh, high energetic non-thermal super bubble. And uh, it's the only one that we know of in the LMC. And the next one that we know is um, all, again, also in M31, 33. So in, in the other um, galaxy that accompanies um, the Milky Way. So it's very, very rare case. And if you compare that in radio, it's of course, it's a non-thermal source. It's very bright in, in, X, in, in radio. They, here you see an, an index map in radio. And if you look at the, the spectra in X-rays, you can also confirm that it is most likely synchrotron emission that we see in X-rays. 
And if you then combine the flux that we get from X-rays down to, to radio, we can also get an estimate for the, the, the energy of the electrons that are accelerated in this super bubble. And we get a number of about 80, 80 tera electron volt. And um, this source is also one of the first sources that had been detected uh, in the TEV with HES. So many of you know, have seen this image before. So this is uh, the X, again the XMM image, and here you see significant detection coming from in the TEVs. And there was uh, uh, there is of course discussion: can that be leptonic or also some hadronic emission? And uh, what would cause such an emission? So, of course, it can be that there is an, since there is a, um, a active super bubble, there was maybe a young supernova remnant and when a uh, supernova that went off recently you will have a very strong shock. And as soon as it hits the, the wall, it can create such um, non thermal emission. But maybe also the stars that are still there, they can also. Um, uh, provide colliding shocks, um, acceleration in colliding shocks. And uh, the last thing which we did in the study of this super, um, super bubble is to look at it in X-rays with Chandra, which has the highest spatial resolution. So we can resolve the filaments that you see, uh, the non-thermal filaments in the outer parts and get an idea of the profile. And assuming that this is limited by the advection of the accelerated particles, we can make an estimate of the magnetic fields. And it turns out this, uh, the magnetic field estimate is rather low. So um, the dominant uh, emission is most likely leptonic for this case. But uh, this is of course not uh, very um, surprising because you have these interstellar structures that is already existent. And then if there is a strong shock that, that, that uh, runs, um, inside it and hits the wall, you, you would expect such high energy emission. Now, um, I've now spoken to the, about the most prominent cases in which you can um, uh, see uh, X-ray to very high energy emission in, um, in interstellar medium. But of course, we also have other source, interesting sources in the ga galaxies that can do uh, make X-ray emission, like stars, like our sun. Um, due to flares and, and the magnetic fields will be uh, are bright X-ray sources. And also uh, um, compact objects like uh, white dwarf neutron stars and black holes, especially if they are young and or if they're accreting material like uh, what is illustrated here in these images. If you have a neutron star or white dwarf or a black hole that is accreting matter, a lot of energy is released and you will see it as bright, see them as bright X-ray sources. So there are a lot of interesting sources in, in galaxies, but of course, even more so if you go outside the galaxies. So um, AGNs, the nuclear regions of active galaxies are very bright X-ray sources and they are so bright, you can even look at the very, uh, very far distances. So there, um, and also the galaxy clusters. Now here, you, what you see is an optical image of the coma cluster. So all these white points are distant galaxies. And if you look at the same position in X-rays, again, with a kind of a small survey performed with XMM-Newton, here this uh, green box is this, the same area as what you see in the optical. You see very bright diffuse emission that fills this interior, the central region of the galaxy cluster. So galaxy, um, the intergalactic medium is very hot and is also a hot uh, um, yeah, thin plasma. So you will see a lot of thermal emission coming from galaxy cluster. So by looking at those AGNs and the galaxy clusters, you can also study the entire universe because these are the objects that you can use to um, look at as far as possible. And this is also the reason why Erosita was developed. So uh, the idea was to study the entire X-ray sky to the um, furthest distances, but also the nearby sources. And um, as we said already, uh, no, sorry, maybe I haven't, <laughs> sorry. But uh, Erosita, the, the telescope that I wanted, I want to talk about, is a collaborator, it was um, 
produced in collaboration between German, German consortium and, and Russia. So it's a German X-ray telescope and is now uh, located on a Russian spacecraft, the Spectrum Röntgen Gamma, and is supposed to do the, an all-sky survey in the soft to now up to medium X-ray band. So we want to go up, we, we go up to 10 kilo electron volt. And it has a rather good spatial resolution and spectral resolution, which was not the case with Rosat back then. And here you see some uh, comparison of the graphs. So it's uh, the effective area of the telescope average over the field of view. Erosita is the red line and uh, compared with the actual uh, currently working X-ray telescope Chandra and XMM Newton or also Rosat PSPC. So compare, comparing to Rosat, which did in Oscar Simbe, you see you have a um, very strong improvement in the sensitivity. And uh, therefore, Erosita will be able to study up to 100,000 galaxy clusters, mi millions of AGNs. So these are the, this is this, like the main science driver of the Erosita mission to study the <clears throat> the, the entire universe, especially focusing on, on studies of the dark matter, dark energy. But also we also want to do galactic X-ray uh, studies. So we will uh, study the physics of galactic X-ray sources. And this is uh, what the main topic of this, um, of this talk actually is. And uh, another comparison between Erosita and the other telescopes. So uh, with XMM Newton or Chandra, we have so far had, had a very, a very powerful telescopes with a very um, high sensitivity and a good, good spatial and spectral resolution. The only um, disadvantage is that the field of views are smaller like compared to the moon. Um, here in this image, you see it's in there arc minute range, uh, while the Erosita has a field of view of one degree and it can do these scanning observations. So that's the reason why we can do an all sky survey, which is just not possible with X-ray telescopes like XMM Newton or Chandra. And we can also study larger fields. So not we can do deep observations of large uh, sky fields. And here you see Erosita before it was launched. So this was assembled in, at the MPE in Garching. Uh, Erosita consists of seven telescopes. So you see the telescope modules here, one of it here with the nested shells for the X-ray optics. This is the, um, uh, the instrument in the focal point where you have the CCD detector with the filter wheel. And so this, if this is the front view, this would be the back view. So you see the, all the in instrument, the electronics in here. And this was ready to be, uh, so it, it was a very long preparation until we, it was ready to be launched. And uh, then finally at the end of 2016, it uh, could be then prepared for, uh, to be shipped to Russia where then it was mounted on the spacecraft. So here you see the, the, the plane that brought it from Munich to Moscow in January, 2017. And um, then in Moscow, it went to Lavochkin, which is the a com company that uh, produced uh, yeah, the, the, the satellite. Here you see Erosita together with Art XC, which is another X-ray telescope. Um, from the Russian collaboration, which is an hard X-ray telescope uh, mounted on spectrum Röntgen Gamma. And it, it went through a lot of testing. And then finally in uh, mid 2019, the uh, spectrum Röntgen Gamma was ready to be launched. So it was then brought to Baikonur. And uh, here you see how it is now mounted on top of the Proton M rocket, uh, Erosita again at XC with uh, the navigator platform. And it is now moved out to the, um, to the launch pad 
And here the first launch was supposed to be in June. And you see some colleagues here from MPE and other participating institutes. That's Peter Predil, who has been the PI of uh, the Erosita project for a very long time. Um, and as you might know, um, he was now succeeded by uh, Andrea Meloni. But on this day, there was some technical, there were some technical issues. So um, Spectrum Röntgen Gamma could not be launched and it was shifted by three weeks. And finally, July 13th, this was the good day. Um, Erosita on board Spectrum Röntgen Gamma along with RTXC um, was launched successfully. And um, this was more or less two years ago. And ever since, um, it is taking a lot of nice data. So in the first, first month, we had the calibration and performance verification uh, phase after the telescope was commissioned. And half a year late, uh, after the launch, we started with the first all sky survey. And you should know that we are going uh, one all sky survey, one sky um, scan of the entire sky takes half a year and we are going to make eight of such um, scans. Therefore, the entire, the full old sky survey will take um, four years and we are in the middle of it. So we have finished three scans, so three old sky surveys now. We are in uh, eras four right now and we will continue. And um, some, some of you might have uh, also heard that uh, a couple of months ago, we released uh, the uh, first data of Erosita. So these are the data that were taken in during this calibration and performance verific verification phase. And um, this, uh, this was called the early data release. So we released the data plus uh, we, uh, some publications uh, reporting on the results of the analysis of this data. And here, this is um, just a summary of what we release. So you see, we have all the data that um, are available taking from the first months. We also have the science analysis system, ESAS, which, is also, which was also uh, made public at the same time and uh, some online documentation. So if you are interested in looking at the Erosita data, you should go to this webpage. At, uh, hosted by the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, and you can take a look at these nice data. Um, right uh, here now, if in the yeah, rest of the time, I would like to show you some results that we have obtained. So as as I said, we are going to make eight surveys of the entire sky, and what you see now is an image created only after the first survey. So um, so this is the entire sky comparable to what you've seen from uh, Rosa, the first slide that I showed. And you already realize that you see much more uh, structures in here. You see a lot of point sources. So this is due to the much better uh, spatial resolution. And you, you recognize all these structures that you have seen before, but in a much better uh, in, or finer structures. And um, and in each of these regions, you can also take spectra, like similar to the resolution that I showed before, uh, similar to what you, uh, you, what you have for XMM Newton. So now you can go and, and study the entire X-ray sky um, also in taking spectra. And when you look at this image, there is one striking thing that you realize, and you have realized it as well, also looking at Rosat. So this is this one structure here, which we call the North Polar Spur. And in the beginning, this has been uh, discussed to be uh, the part in, um, in which the, this local bubble in which we are located in, I talked about it. So this is this large super bubble in which the super, um, the solar system is located inside. And this local bubble has a neighboring bubble, which is called the loop, loop one bubble, and it's merging. And um, one uh, explanation for this, this ring like large, huge uh, ring like structure in, seen in the sky is that we see the rim of this, um, these two bubbles where they meet. Uh, of course, this is not ruled out yet, but there are also uh, other uh, way, um, ways to explain it. And um, 
here in this image, what is also now striking is that you don't have only a large bubble here, but you clearly start seeing this bubble also in the southern part of, um, of this X-ray sky, it, which was existent in Rodat, but a rosat image, but was not so as uh, prominent as you can see it here. So just marking it again. So you see here, the, you see the northern part, the North Polar Spur, but here you also see some emission here, very faint emission in the south. We now call it the Erosita bubble. So here you see the image, the entire sky without the point sources, only in the range between 0 0.6 to one kilo electron volt, where this emission coming from the Erosita bubbles are most prominent. And as you see, you, you clearly see this ring like uh, the arc, arc here, up here, and also below here. And of course, if you see that, you realize that it must be somehow associated to the Fermi bubbles that, um, was, that were detected a while ago. So here now you see an overlay between the Erosita image and uh, the Fermi image. And you see, so this in, in the inner part, you clearly see the Fermi bubbles and they are surrounded, seem to be surrounded by the Erosita bubbles. So how can you explain it? Of course, it can be uh, still the rim of our um, nearby uh, local bubble, but it can also in addition be caused by some outflow from the galactic center so what you have is you have this uh, outflow causing a hot galactic wind and will cause shocks and you will see the inner more energetic part as of in Fermi bubbles, but then the shock medium in the, in the halo uh, will be visible still in X-rays and that's why we see it in Erosita. And as I said, we can now take also spectra and from that we can derive uh, the surface brightness, temperatures, abundances, and make an estimate calculations of, of the creation of such bubbles. Um, shortly after we published these results, um, there were several other people working on that. And in this case, uh, by software and Kataoka, it, would, it was also shown that uh, not only um, do their calculations support this idea of a galactic center outflow, but they also find a crater in the galactic disk in the distribution of the gold gas, so the atomic hydrogen and the molecular gas, where you see kind of the base of this outflow. Now I want to move out of the galaxy again to the large Magellanic cloud. Maybe you are now tired of hearing it, but as, as it is the best place to look at uh, extended structures in galaxy, here you see the large Magellanic cloud. In the optical we see a lot of emission coming from the stars. Then if you take again only the narrow band uh, emission line images in the optical edge alpha, oxygen three and silicon uh, sulfur two, sorry then you start seeing all these emission nebula here, you see the Tarantula nebula. And that's typically because you have this partly ionized warm interstellar medium. And if you look at it in X-rays, this is what it looks like. It's an image taken with Erosita, fine. With uh, the other telescopes like X, uh, XMM Newton, we have been trying to cover the entire LMC, but it's really difficult with the small field of view. With Erosita, it's done in, in one go, you have uh, a lot of diffuse emission and here you see again the Tarantula or the Celtic or the sea. So we have um, been performed, we had, had performed uh, longer ob observations in this region because, so this part around the uh, Tarantula Nebula was our first light of Erosita. And uh, here you see the supernova remnant N132D, which is the brightest supernova remnant in the large Magellanic cloud. And um, also a calibra nice calibration source because it has emission, a lot of emission lines. Therefore, it, these regions have been observed very deeply and with long exposures in the beginning. So this is these data we already analyzed um, before the early data release and uh, mainly focusing on the diffuse emission. So like here, for example, you can remove all the point sources and do some spectral analysis in these regions. And what you see again, so for example, in the uh, 30 Dorados, typically you have this, as I said, this thermal emission, you see a lot of emission lines here. 
Also, if you look in regions between these uh, prominent sources, you see a lot of emission coming from the interstellar medium. But if you go into the interior of the 30 Doradus or in the 30 Doradus Sea, you also see this additional non-thermal component. So this was the initial study of the interstellar plasma performed in the LMC. And um, you can also compare the distribution of this hot phase with the warm phase, as I said before, this is again the optical image. And what you realize is that there is a lot of emission everywhere coming from this diffuse emission, but then it looks um, greenish here. And this is because again, I'm used, I have used the three color presentation. So this is soft X-rays and here some soft X-rays seems to be, um, to, absor to be absorbed by, by something that is all, also um, in agreement with the distribution of the warm ionized gas. So there seems to be a lot of also cooler material in front of the material that is emitting X-rays. So what you can do is you take all these spectra, as I showed it before, in these small regions and do spectral analysis. And not only you can study the properties of the emission, the emitting plasma, but you can also study the absorption because X-rays are easily absorbed. And you can derive the column density, and this is shown here. So this, this image on the left is the column density obtained from the spectral analysis of each of these regions. And if you now compare that to the measured column density from the atomic gas on the right-hand side, you clearly see there is a nice agreement. So these contours are taken from here and overplotted here. So now what it, it looks like, what we can do with Erosita due to this spatial and thanks to the spatial and the spectral resolution, we can do X, some really um, analysis also of, of not only of the emission that comes from X-ray sources, but also the absorption of material that lies between us. So in principle, what we can do is something like what you do at the doctor if you go and make an image of your hand or whatever, and you get information about the hand. Now we can do that also with this X-ray telescope. Um, what we also studied in this new data is the, um, all the supernova remnants, which we find in this area. So um, there, are, as I said, there is one, N132D, but there are also a lot of known supernova remnants, bright sources. On the right-hand side, you see the radio image because supernova remnants, um, also bright, uh, very bright sources in, in radio. And we also could confirm a new supernova remnant. Here you see, this is for visualization. I um, We used a mask, so the data is cut here, but there is uh, additional data also here next to it. And you see it here. So here we confirmed a new supernova remnant, which was detected in the optical and can now be confirmed as well in it. X-rays. So we will be searching for new supernova remnants in the Magellanic clouds, but also in the galaxy. And we are sure that we will be finding a lot of new in, in interesting sources. Then 1987A, or maybe let me go back. You can see supernova 1987A here as this bright source. This is an interesting source that is now um, developing from a supernova to a supernova remnant. Here you see the change of the spectrum from exome Newton, which we have been covering all the time. So you see that especially this hot component is getting brighter. You see this black uh, dotted line. And, and that's because the, the, the shock wave of this supernova, which was for a long time interacting with this equatorial ring around um, the progenitor, now has most likely left this ring and, and is now expanding in the H2 region in the circumstellar medium. And we can confirm that with Erosita. So this is the Erosita spectrum, the latest Erosita spectrum um, compared to XMM Newton spectrum. And they are in very good agreement. And if you look at the light curve for the different um, uh, energy bands, Erosita confirms that at the softer um, energies it uh, levels uh, down, but the higher, uh, the hotter component of the outer shock waves uh, keeps increasing. 
Then, yeah, as I said, N132D, our calibration source, we are looking at it very regularly. So this is an image of the region and, and, and zoom in on the supernova remnant um, from the very um, first uh, data. And here you see the spectrum. You can clearly see this uh, bright oxygen lines, iron lines, neon lines. And this is the reason why it is also used as a calibration source, especially uh, for this for the spectral resolution. So we are analyzing these data and um, we have so much data from N132D, we have to see how we are going to publish them. Then I wanted to talk about a structure seen in our Milky Way, the Carina Nebula. So it's a very, also a very bright H2 region. You might have seen that before. You, it's also bright in, in infrared, which you see here in the lower panel, um, taken with all wires. And it's in, in, um, famous because it hosts the Eta Carine uh, wolf rayet system. It's a colliding wind binary. It's a very um, high energetic source. And this is the image taken with Erosita. So you see clearly, again, in three color presentations. So red is soft, blue is hard, and all these massive stars emit hard X-rays. And then the shock, uh, shocked region around it, higher energies, greenish and then in the outer parts you see the softer x-ray emission from the shocked hot uh, hot plasma so we are anal currently analyzing this emission and also looking for indications of non-thermal non non emission maybe coming from the accelerated particles then what else do we see of course this is the most striking thing that you see if you're interested in in the extended emission this is the vila supernova remnant here you see a zoom in onto this point so this is the vila supernova remnant again in three color presentation you see the vila pulsar here in blue the neutron star with the pulsar wind nebula then you have the um the additional supernova remnant which uh, yeah we call vila junior um, you have here this nice non-thermal shell. So this is a completely non-thermal supernova remnant with NCCO. Then nearby you have Puppies A. So you see this uh, nice bright thing. This is another supernova remnant seen in projection and in, into this direction. And you see, so this is again a three color presentation using different color scales. You see very nice uh, filamentary structures. You can also see the neutron star inside it. And we are now doing uh, a detailed spectral analysis of this emission. And uh, we are also studying the ejector in the supernova remnant. Then uh, another interesting source that was found in this ERAS data is this new supernova remnant, which is called the Hoinga supernova remnant. Um, it is also confirmed in, in radio, the blue emission is radio, and in X-rays we see this filling red emission. Um, so uh, this is, in principle, this is the first supernova remnant we newly identified in our Milky Way based on ERAS data. And I'm sure there will be many more. And um, this brings me also ready to the end of my talk. Now I just wanted to make some, uh, give you some uh, outlook to what you can be expecting. So we are now currently working on all these data and especially we have uh, um, a new research unit in the core institutes of Erosita, so which is MPE, us and then Tübingen, Hamburg and Potsdam. Um, funded by the DFG, especially on the study of galactic sources. And a big part of this research unit will be working on the interstellar structures like this and, and the entire background and the entire interstellar medium in the Milky Way, but also supernova remnants and especially also in the um, study of the Magellanic clouds because they are nearby. And as I said, you can also the small Magellanic cloud, which I didn't mention, but there is uh, there are a lot of data where we can study all these type of sources. Yes, that, that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>